So we, all, we had another project that we had been working on for a while that was just in the pitch phase that really was about like people getting struck with this weird, what seemed to be an illness and it end, ends up being like a supernatural thing. And we kind of reached out to our agents with that idea and they were like, no way in hell are you going to sell anything that's like virusy or diseasey right now? They're like, people just don't want to, you know, people want to, people want escapism right. right now. Not necessarily, doesn't have to be, you know, warm and fuzzy positivity, but they want uh, escapism. They don't want anything that reminds them of, at least this is the, yeah. you know, what we're hearing from our agents is that anything that kind of reflects the times right now is not selling now. People are not interested in that. Interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, um, it's funny. My, my agent, I guess I've been getting like mixed messages because one message was that publish editors only want to see proposals like about how to build your immune system, how to do this or mm -hmm. that, you know, that. But then um, also that same message that you just said of like negativity about the, it, or descriptions of a current negative situation is not, yeah, not gonna do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and for us, I mean, we, we mostly do horror. Yeah. Um, you know, so there's always, a, there's always a degree of metaphor right. with horror. Uh, th the one idea that we had was just too close to the bone. But we're about to go out and pitch another idea that's, you know, probably in some ways even darker, but it's, it's period and it's kind of got creatures and stuff in it. And they're like, oh yeah, that'll be fine because it will allow people to put themselves into another place and time that doesn't reflect today. So you got your start with, uh, your first big movie was Blair Witch Project, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. First feature that I ever made. And you've, you've pretty much done horror since then? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, you kind of get, you know, you kind of get known for one thing, you have success in one thing, and that, that becomes the easy sell. And does, uh, are, do you feel horror? Or, like, as a horror thinker, like when you're creating, do you, do you yourself scare yourself? I, I loved being scared when I was a kid. Like, mm -hmm. I was one of those kids that loved watching horror movies way before I probably should have. Mm -hmm. uh, like the Freddy Krueger and all that? Well, I'm a little older than, than that. Oh. I mean, you know, by the time Freddy Krueger came out, I was a little older and, but I'm talking about when I was a little kid. Like, you know, stay up and watch like the, the local, you know, horror thing that would come on at, you know, 11 o'clock and right. then the TV would turn off at one in the morning or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the TV goes off and you're left with a... Yeah, a, yeah, play the national color. anthem. Right, and then you're just... Like, yeah, and then you're just... Scared to death. Exactly. <laughs> I've spent many times on the couch right. with the TV on static because I couldn't get up to, to turn it off. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't... Uh, it's not like that was the only kind of... You know, if I... Probably if I had my druthers, I would make some sort of Star Wars-y kind of epic sci-fi fantasy kind of thing. Um, but, you know, horror is what works. Does the virus scare you? Uh, not incredibly. Yeah, my wife and I are both very lucky in that regard. You know, it's a little interruption of the way we work, but in terms of, like, having to jump through a bunch of hoops to figure out how to take care of the kids and all that, that really hasn't been an issue. So we're very lucky on that front. Um... And on, on another you know, side, because you're in Portland, do you think that the virus has uh, had an influence on the protests? I mean, look, if you look at images from the protests in Portland, and vast majority of the people wear masks, I don't think they distance. I think mm -hmm. it's almost impossible, especially when there's you know, 4,000 people yeah. downtown. Um, but do you think it caused a release of emotion that, or anything like that? that you know, it, 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 it could be. It, it could be. I mean, I just, you know, personally with, uh, you know, my wife's response to things, you know, obviously the stuff with George Floyd and then the resulting, you know, protest and some people would say riots, uh, 
you know, we definitely like in support of that and understand why people had those initial, you know, really visceral reactions at the, at the first. Um, and my daughter was definitely interested in going to some of those early marches, and, and we did. Uh, but my wife didn't really get affected by it to the point of like really feeling compelled to go out until the, uh, all the federal officers started appearing in Portland and throwing people in vans and right. kind of taking things to the next level. Was a bridge too far for her? Yeah, and, and well, and I think for a lot of people, that's why I went from, you know, because they were winding down. The irony was that the, the uh, protests were, were winding down, you know, so they went from mm -hmm. 40 people, like you saw last night probably, to 4,000. Yeah, almost overnight. Yeah, I mean, it, it took about, it only took about a week for it to be, I think they were up to like 4,000 people. Were you outraged by that, by the? By the, the federal yeah. stuff? I mean, yes and no. It was pretty clear to me that it was um, uh, political theater from the very beginning. Um, if I really thought that, I just don't buy into hyperbole all that much. So, you know, jack booted, you know, brown shirt thugs, like, I just don't, I don't respond to that. I know that those are dudes who, you know, probably some assholes amongst them, but they're just dudes doing their job, and their job right now is to implement a completely political bullshit order so that Fox News has some stuff to videotape. Yeah. If I thought they were really down there to, you know, destroy people's civil rights, it would be one thing, but I never, I never think that was the purpose. I think they were, you know, playing a game. Fake news? Kind of. No, it's not fake news. It's real news, but it's but it's Some but it's but yeah, it's political theater. It's like a set. I mean, Trump and his guys just looked at. I mean, look, the the protesters have given them a great backdrop. They fucked that building up, you know. So now they've got a a great backdrop. They've got all these kids who look like Antifa, whatever the fuck that means. And then so you get to go down there and like you know shoot tear gas at them and look tough and make the left look like wackos and you know they couldn't pass it up you know and i think they saw that that was they were about to lose their set <laughs> you know as a filmmaker's like oh we better go down there and shoot we're gonna lose that we're gonna lose that set if we don't get down there and i and that's what it felt like to me so and it i mean i thought it was bullshit uh but i, I never got like fundamentally like upset okay. about it yeah I mean, I was upset about it, obviously, because I, I thought it was bullshit no matter what, but I never got outraged because I looked at it that way from kind of from the, from the very beginning. That's a really interesting perspective. Um, so just following with that, if, if, this, if you could write the end to this movie we're in right now, <laughs> what, what would that be? Wow. Um, it can be in a week or six months or whatever. So, wait. The, wait it doesn't the, have to be the ending that you would like to live in. Well, the right. ending that you would like to see on well, the like, Well, that's the thing. As a horror filmmaker, yeah, yeah, I, I tell it. you how I, you know, how it would go as a, as a, as a, as a horror filmmaker. Well, look, I've, I've, been, I've been playing around with like a, you know, a Civil War script for years. Like actually um, when, when Clinton was still president so obviously I haven't really acted on it but uh, you know I've always been kind of intrigued by what what could what could trigger a modern civil war um, so I would if I was like put put on my you know horror you know thriller writer cap and tried to extrapolate from now to some sort of story that is a horror slash, you know, political thriller, you know, this would all continue to, to disintegrate and Trump refuses to leave office and then, you know. Civil War. Civil War. But... Do you have any idea what the two sides would be called? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, I would be... The thing about it is, is like when I really realistically think about it, I mean, 
Um, you know, generally speaking, civil wars don't really become wars until the military is involved. Mm -hmm. And, you know, foolishly or not, I still have a lot of faith in our military uh, as, a, as, a stabilizing, as a stabilizing force. Right. You were uh, in the military, right? I was. I was in the Army. Uh -huh. And it's not necessarily because of that, although that's obviously a part of it, but I think if you look at the way the military has conducted itself during all of this, they've come down pretty firmly on the side that's not Trump's. Yeah. Um, I think if uh, all the generals and everybody were like completely behind him, I think there would be fucking, that might be trouble. But if you don't have the military and you don't have the intelligence services, you can cause some trouble, but you can't cause real trouble. If you have the military and the intelligence services behind you, that's when you can really cause fucking trouble. And he's enough of an idiot and so narcissistic and so self-absorbed. And he's shit on so many of these really powerful men that I just don't think he's got the, you know, I don't think he's got the, the proper network to really make shit bad.